I didn't ask how many you know things to map actually. So one third maybe, a little bit less. So who does not know what OpenStreetMap is? Well, you've just heard something in the talk. Okay, well we'll talk about it. So um, hello, my name is Holger. I'm part of um, an association called Sozialhelden, which uh, my fellow friend and colleague uh, founded, uh, Raul, who can be here today. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, my Twitter is HolgerD, hashtag GeoMonday, and yeah, so I'm uh, trying to talk tonight about the question, does this place have a stairs at the entry? So who here thinks this place here has stairs at the entry? Okay, one, two, three, four, okay. So, well, there are not many people in wheelchairs here, so most of you may, yeah, who doesn't know? <laughs> Most of you don't know, basically, right? So there's actually, you can enter from the back, because there are actually a stay at the entry. And I also see that some people you can see from here, right? So, I will talk for the next few minutes um, about this question, which actually we had in 2009, or like six years ago. Um, Raul and me, we know each other since a long time, and we like to hang out in cafes in Berlin and make plans for the future and whatever, and drink coffee and also beers uh, at a place which had everything in Schöneberg and I was always like, you know, this is not such a great cafe, Berlin is full of it and we love to be nerdy about this, but why are we always going to the same one? And uh, his, uh, his answer is, well, it is one of the few without stairs at the entry and with a wheelchair that's what I need to, you know, I need to go in. And then I said, like, where can you find a list of cafes without stairs? Well, this is a ridiculously easy to find information, right? And it's actually not that easy. You cannot find it anywhere, at least not six years ago. So being nerds at heart and having smartphones, like our first smartphone probably back then, was like, yeah, let's build a map where like everybody can, you know, mark places and then we make a community out of it and it'll be awesome, you know? And there will be people who know where steps are, and, and then they, they report it to others, and uh, others, and other, it's useful for other people as well. You know, people in stro with strollers, and, and so people can actually help each other out. If there are like 1.6 million people uh, in a wheelchair in Germany, there are 1.6 million people who know about wheelchair accessible places, right? Okay, easy enough. Uh, and all the programming languages I knew back then was PHP, and not, I was not really good at it, and there's a content management system called Drupal, which is actually, I checked it yesterday, still existing. And if you don't know how to code, that's probably like WordPress, the fastest way to get a website online. And had some models with geotagging and whatever, and I said, like, yeah, sure, let's do it. Uh, and so I spent one or two nights hacking a website uh, doing all this. And then I had this website, actually. I didn't find a screenshot uh, without installing everything from some backup in you know, some setup or somewhere. The point was, I had a map. I could mark places. I could even have users and everything without a line of code, which was really awesome. But the point was, it had zero marked places. And if you wanted to enter a new place, you had to fill in the street name, the house number, the name of the place, the city, the zip code, and two screens full of forms to actually create even the cafe we were sitting in. And, and this was, wait, I can just, and so it actually, so it was just like a week or so to, to build this, but it's actually a huge chore to, you know, add places. It's no fun, and if it's no fun, we don't do it. You know, people don't do it. So back then, I don't know, I, I even found the old logo. There was like this huge database with all the cafes and the nice cafes uh, in Germany and I think from sometime even in Europe called Quipe, which I was a big fan of. And I said like, yeah, Quipe has all this information. Why don't we ask them, you know? 
And it's, it was a startup, venture capital backed, uh, and they were even based in Hamburg and for some time also in Berlin, I think. And I thought, okay, this is awesome. Go to the Google group, check out the API documentation. So I did this and I found some tag where you can actually see this, the opening hours or something, but not the wheelchair accessible, the, the, the wheelchair data. They even had like in some menu, is it wheelchair accessible? It was a bit like handicap friendly or something, but it was something like that. So we were like, you know what? We don't do it, quite does it, and we just you know, make it show it a little bit different or something. So I couldn't find this exact data, and the API terms were like, you know, you need to discuss with us and whatever. But first I felt this bug and saying, I cannot get wheelchair accessible places from Quiet. Can you help me? So um, in the Google group, uh, and then actually the answer was no. Because the answer usually is, and I worked in product management, is when you say no, you say not now, it's on our list, it's definitely on our list. And uh, <laughs> it's still online. Uh, so yeah, it's not exposed in the API right now, so how important is it for you? It's actually not on our list. So we could do it, but nah, we don't. So, um, so actually, we, we stopped the project, basically, because we didn't want to do it ourselves. We had no idea what to do. So it was 2009, we had other jobs, and said, well, maybe then that's not working, right? So the Sozialhelden, so we are the nonprofit organization, we do other things as well for another project. We won actually a prize with a lot of prize money called um, Deutsche Engagement Prize. So we won 10,000 euros in December, so like almost one year later. And we were like, you know, what was about this project? Maybe we can have something new, maybe we do something new. So, and in January, I said like, well, there's this thing called OpenStreetMap. And you know, well, it, it actually solves our problem because we don't need to permission from anybody to use the data. It's a horrible wiki, I spend nights finding things uh, even the registration process is, I don't know what, and so on, but there's a user group in Berlin with like four people attending, I showed up there, <laughs> and everybody was like, yeah, sure, it's, it's possible, whatever, so I said, if it's going to work, maybe it's there. I even looked up, the, I have this wheelchair tag, you just, you should say, this wheelchair tag was existing back then, and it had 900 marked places, so we would start with 900 wheelchair places, you know, and also there are hundreds of thousands of points of interest. Okay, so we found a developer, friends of ours who work and who was a freelancer and said like, we give you a little bit of our money, or more like half of it, probably. <laughs> Everything in the end, yeah. <laughs> and so to, to, to build this first version, and the idea is there's a map and there's pins on it, and yeah, it should somehow work, and it should get all the data from OpenStreetMap and put it back there. Um, and I got the first screenshot uh, from WheelMap. It's even on localhost, so it wasn't even deployed. And this is what it looked like. And what you can see, well, that's the first version of working one in 2010, and this is actually today. So what I like very much about it is, it's, it's out of focus, actually. <laughs> uh, well, what I like about it is that it's still pretty similar. It has some features, so uh, which are very similar. We have this red, uh, orange, and green places, and are, are they accessible or not? And we have categories, they are now uh, hidden a little bit, and actually people can change something. But actually for the first three years it looked something like this. And I know, I remember that uh, we, we had this online, we spent some money, we were the biggest fans, we marked all our neighborhood within you know, an hour or two, because now it was easy, all the places were there. It was slow in a way, it was buggy and whatever. And then we found out actually there are other people you know, who are doing this. And, and Raul, who is very you know, good in social media and knows a lot of people, he worked in the radio back then, so he knew a few people. He was invited to a podcast about open street map and these things. And we were in the New York newspaper and then radio. And after a, a couple of months we found out actually there's like Places coming in by people, you know, people are marking places, we don't know those people. Uh, because there's, we had a little counter, no, we didn't have it back then, but that's like one, one thing we built then. So it was about 200, uh, 150 places a day, and something like this. So, and 
actually, then we find out, okay, this is maybe alive, you know? It's working without us doing it, basically. We had 25 places with where we had built everything, and now we have like 200 places marked every day by other people, and so other people find it useful. So, and the rest is actually history. Now we have more than half a million marked places and OpenStreetMap, and this representation is probably the biggest database in the world for wheelchair accessible places. And we are online in 22 languages, we have an iPhone app, we have an Android app, um, we had... Mobile phone is coming. Mobile phone is, is maybe coming. Uh, Apple Watch is probably on the way. No, no, it's not. But actually, the iPhone app we built is open source, so if anybody of you wants to build something on, on um, Apple Watch, Watch or something, go to on GitHub and fork our repository. We have the back end and everything is documented. Uh, so we would love to see this, actually. So. Yeah, and I'm not going to tell the story on how, how this ended up and being, you know, this small nonprofit association with, you know, employees uh, working in this community, but more like what I promised is to tell about the things which worked and which didn't work uh, when you do such a project. And so the lessons learned, actually. So one is the clear use case helped a lot, I think. Because the first thing we did when we got some attention was yeah, but it's just for people in wheelchair. What about blind people? And we're like, yeah, but blind people don't have a problem with stairs, you know? So, or actually, the, the more honest answer is we didn't know anybody who couldn't see, so we have no idea what their problems are. And we thought it's really, really complex and complicated in the next talk, right? So, and, and other, so what about norms? There's an ISO certification on wheelchair accessibility for hotel beds, because hotel beds need to have a certain height, we learned. And we are like, dude, nobody's going to a hotel with a, you know, and measuring the heights of beds. I'm not going to do it, you're not going to do it, right? So what's the easiest thing, you know? Is there a step in the entry or not? And we're going to do this. And this, and in any more complex things, you can put in the comments, but that's not helping. Well, it's probably helping, it's great if they're wheelchair, if, if those people, you know, if those hotels are accessible, but we, we feel not able to help with this right now. So, but this is the use case, and this is uh, getting into places is what, what helped us to, you know, go to all the cafes in Berlin, actually, and the world, probably, and, uh, and this is what we're doing now. The other thing is, the product was useful from day one, so we didn't need, you know, a marketplace or something, where one side does it and the other stone, so it worked for us. I marked my neighborhood, I, it changed my view, because, it, even though I knew all for years, I had no idea how many steps are in Kreuzberg, you know, where I live. So, and also it was useful to anybody else in Kreuzberg because these marked places don't go away and their, you know, concrete buildings don't go away that fast. So, the other thing we learned is geo-information systems community, I call it, is nerdy and is really great. So, we had no idea about program. As I said, I'm a shitty Drupal installer. That's, you know, spaghetti code is the best I could do. But this, I like this inclusive hacker ethos, you know? I showed up at some meetup and I knew nobody and said, by the way, I have no idea what you're all doing. And they said, like, yeah, sit down, I'll show you. You know, it's fine. They didn't ask any question. They didn't ask questions about, not really much about wheelchairs. It was just like, yeah, that's a cool project. And also, there are notes. You know what notes are? You know? And I like this attitude, actually. So you can be quirky, it's fine. Everybody is, you know, strange in a way. And, you know? So it's what you do and not who you are. And also the idea of OpenStreetMap in general, specifically, is this duocracy. It's like, do I need permission? Well, you know, who am I to tell you what to do? Do it. There are some rules you should do because if this is a rule, there's no police here, you know? It's kind of anarchy. And there's huge fights about everything and whatever. But by the way, if you're going to do it, well, maybe it's a good idea to tell some people, and there will be reverts and whatever, you know, tagging wars or whatever. But that's what it is. There's nobody better than other people. And if they're better, other people will, you know, try to interfere. It's a huge chaos, but whatever. Right now, you know, there are no license fees, whatever. So I like, we like this a lot, and that was the reason why this worked and quite didn't. And so in, even in July, we went to uh, the State of the Map Conference in Girona, where we met all these people who knew so much more about geo-information data systems than we did, and they welcomed us just like that, and said, like, yeah, that's the same thing. And do you know, in the US, this is not really a big problem, because we sue everybody who has stairs in the entry. 
And in Italy, they said, you know, we have these old buildings and they're like hundreds and thousands of years old. We cannot tear them down. But it's an interesting problem. So we had really interesting conversations. And there are people who, doing the, you know, who did other things back in the time as well. I remember somebody clicking every time while well, walking to the venue when there was tactile paving on the ground, so like the blind people can feel where the curbs are. And I was like, what is tactile paving, you know? And, and what is like, geotagging, by the way? And how do you import this? And so they were already open, and I left this conference. And also, this ethos of mapping parties is really great, so where people come together and say, like, let's map something, let's map, you know, opening hours of Spätis, or where you can have Club Martin in Berlin, or where surveillance cameras are. And we said, well, we have one special use case where we check accessible places. And it turned out that a lot of people who had no idea about mapping, geodata, were very interested in this event. And now we help other people do these events. We help employees, for example, this is a mapping party from Indian Scout employees, they have 600 employees and they ran around the whole city in, in Munich and in Berlin. We help Boy Scouts go out and map for OpenStreetMap and, actually, and they, they rented an, a wheelchair to test out the curbs and everything. Um, in Bologna we did a, there was a huge mapping party event in the center of the city um, so, and those are the things we help built now, actually, so that other people are the ones who can do it, and it's basically we use all the tools for open treatment, for example, um, walking papers and stuff like that. And this was in Tutlingen, for example, before and after. Yeah, but on the other side, also geo-information systems are very complicated, because from this first screenshot to the second screenshot I showed you in the beginning, they were really similar, but actually there were so hard things we had to solve later on, which nobody saw, which cost a lot of time and money. For example, we learned that there are nodes and ways and you know, relations, shapes, I called it. And so one third of the places actually were not on wheel map, but they were on open street map. So people started creating places and making a huge mess, basically. Um, so we found somebody who can help us to convert those kind of places to, the, to, to points because we only works with, you know, no, with singular points. So they converted shapes to points where I think the weighted average is from whatever and there's some magic going out in the behind that is just like 30 seconds behind to simple open street map. And nobody actually noticed that we did this and so complicated thing unless but we had like I think overnight, two million more places which could be mapped and less duplicates, especially less duplicates because the OpenStreetMap community hated us for this. The other thing is also two-way sync, so that we said we don't want to be another database. It's not the idea of open data and also from OpenStreetMap. We actually, and until today, I tried to explain to everybody that we're not selling data, and that we don't even own data. But in the background, we have this worker going on uh, automatically to to sync all the changes all of the WinMap users do with OpenStreetMap. And if you create places you need to be an OpenStreetMap user, which is really a pain in the ass to explain to people in, you know, Boy Scouts in Bavaria. Um, yeah, the other thing is also that we worked on Ruby on Rails because all the, the friends who helped us out with developing were on Ruby on Rails and there was not really a, a gem to wrap this to OpenStreetMap. Um, and so we developed this. It's also an open source on our GitHub page. So there is anybody developing Ruby, it's called Rosemary. And it's another thing which helped us, but it's also open source, so we can link back. But it's really invisible and it's not part of, you know, the, the wheelchair, people in wheelchairs don't even know about this, but it's something we've, we felt it helped us and it maybe helps other people as well. Also what we learned is that points of interest change. Um, and uh, we need and we need to track this sometimes. So one project we did for this was broken lifts, because if you if you go around Berlin or Raoul went around Berlin to Potsdam, you have to take this. There are two different systems, you know, the S-Bahn and the U-Bahn, um, and it was a nuisance to find out which uh, elevators don't work, which lifts are broken, because then it crashes your route basically, and then you're stuck somewhere. Uh, Raul even was stuck in, in, in a U-Bahn station in the middle of the night once. So we talked to, so that was an idea we had in a weekend uh, with great data 
just to show that this could actually be possible. And it took us you know, three years actually to, to get in touch with uh, the, the people owning this kind of thing, how useful this would be if this would be just like an RSS feed. And we learned that elevators are really complicated to track because there's so many of them and there are many manufacturers and different people are, are responsible for them and fixing them. And it's one of those things where you say, yeah, it's just this elevator, whatever. You know, they even have internet. Did you know this? You know, they have an IP address or whatever. But it was, I really have respect for these complex systems. It's like three companies working together, uh, thinking, you know, this kind of talking to each other about data the other party owns and stuff like that. So I learned a lot on the complexity of things. But what was really great is that they were really interested in doing this. And so we have now this platform which can potentially also be used by other data providers, for example, in other cities. And the interesting part is maybe I have yeah. Something we are not crowdsourcing the information from elevators, whatever or not, because you never will have crowdsource that an elevator is working again. Yeah. Everyone would say, Oh, it's broken, but nobody would say it's working. Yeah, you don't walk around noticing that the elevator works. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we rely on automatical data because all elevators are online uh, on the on, on, yeah. Raul knows even you know ten times as much about elevators than I do because he was more involved in this project. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> the other thing we learned is that you can also change point of interest. So they change themselves like elevators; they break. But also you can you can change them. But if there are steps in the entry, you can put a ramp on it, and then it's accessible. So we hesitated for a while, and I said, well, we could just sell mobile ramps, you know. And if you have a cafe or a bakery. You can just buy this from us in an online shop and, and you know, make a sticker on the entrance and if there's somebody with a wheelchair wanting to come in, you can just put it there. In the beginning, actually, we had the idea to, to do like drive-by, um, uh, you know, during the night, just go by and drop some concrete and top of, on the stairs to make ramps out of it. Uh, we never followed this route, though. But, uh, we learned also that this is also complicated because who owns the pavement, who owns the building, who runs the business, or like at least three different parties. So this mobile solution is the best, you know? And the, the owner of the bakery says, of course I, I get this, no problem. And we even had some donation uh, like around Christmas where other people bought them and gave them away for free for, a lot, for small businesses. Uh, it was a huge pain to distribute, but we figured it out. And uh, yeah, so the idea is that we can change places easily like this to just you know sell a ramp and then it's accessible. The other thing also on how to change places is educate um, architecture students on the importance of this. So Raoul did a lecture together with Andre Bocard, who was a professor uh, with students, um, on you know different kinds of accessibility for places for, for you know buildings. That buildings are not such a pain in the ass basically, uh, and we put, we have a the whole lecture is on Vimeo, also on open source license, so that other people can watch it as well. Also, we learned data imports are very complicated. So we got people calling us saying, yeah, we have like 1,000 places we marked in Bielefeld. Do you want them? And we're like, yeah, sounds great, but we have no idea on how to get them in OpenStreetMap. By the way, everybody hates imports in OpenStreetMap anyways. <laughs> you know, it's it's... It's complex because who actually knows it's reliable, is it current, how do you update it? There's like a ton of problems around this. So we have got some data, we, we kept in an Excel file for like three or four years or so until we said, dude, we need to, to do this. There's a company, or uh, um, another organization in Berlin, they have 10,000 places. And we realized we've got to have this 10,000 places. So we eventually got it and we didn't have any technology or solution on how to put them in open street and have because many of them were not in the treatment, some were not. So finally, we find out, okay, it's a predictable problem, we need to match them. We need some, somebody to check, is this point of interest, this one in OpenStreetMap, and there's something you can guess that it's maybe nearby, it's also a bakery, maybe it's it, you know? But it's, it's not good enough, it's too complex for automated tasks. So we built a website where people can look at it, basically. People who live in this neighborhood, in this area who can check it without going to the bakery because you know this other data provider has it but is this the same bakery this 
And you know, when I tell my friend, my, my non-nerd friends, they say like, of course it's a bakery, it's a stupid problem, you know, but yeah, it's a big problem. So we built something much more ugly, but very useful for people who know what's about weight checker. And it's, it's online, it's kind of beta. Um, and, and it works like this, it's that you say, yes, I want to help map these places, this is my OpenStreetMap ID, I log in with OpenStreetMap actually. And then I go like, yeah, it works, and then I, I, I say, on my browser, this is my location, maybe automatically. And this is the bakery down the street, or actually the cafe, I think, this time. And this is the one, it's called, it's called Conde Polyproofer, and that's somewhere here. That's what the data donor told us. That's what we had in this freaking Excel file. So, and this is actually what we got, what we guess is maybe the place from OpenStreetMap. This, in this case, it's just like one, but sometimes like five places, like with uh, childcare, for example, which uh, don't really have titles. So, oh, that's really cool. That's the same one, you know, it's just called Cafe Conde. Yeah, the other is just called Conde. But, well, as a human, I would say, well, that's it. And also, it's on number one here. So, this is really right in the center. That's also definitely that, right. So, I click on that's the one. And if it's not, and I'm not sure, I can skip it. If I say it's not there, I can create it because I'm working with OpenStreetMap. And then I get on this detail page saying, okay, dude, you know, that's the one from OpenStreetMap, that's the data, that's the data from our oh, Excel sheet. And this is actually, if it's green, it's identical, don't worry about it. But this one is red, you know, there's a difference. You should, you should check it. And you don't have to edit it. And this says, save in OpenStreetMap. And if you click this, we will, we will send it to OpenStreetMap, make a comment that this was done to this editor by this user. If there's a problem, contact this user. And yeah, it's an OpenStreetMap user, right? That's a bigger hurdle to understand. And then you, you actually immediately get, get to the next point. So it's like a game, basically. So we tested this on usability tests uh, a couple of times and iterated on this. It's still ugly. Uh, the, what we learned about this is Dude, this is really still very, very complex. So my mother couldn't do this, you know, um, because there are so many things to think about. And so what we do now is that we have actually more like editors doing this. So people who know what the problem is, what the solution is, and they just spent a few couple of nights there. We have a friend who marked like 3,000 places already. We still have like 5,500 to go. So I encourage all of you to go on pointchecker.de to do this. Um, because now you know what the problem is. But we actually gave up on trying to explain people this kind of problem. I can only explain to you, you know, from Geo Monday, who think GeoData is awesome on a Monday night. So, also we learned open data is, is really complicated. Because one thing is to get data. So first we had to tell them, you know, getting data means we don't sign everything, we don't sign anything for it, we don't pay you, you will never, you will never take it back. And some people were like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and then we're like, yeah, but are you really in charge of donating this kind of data? So it's a huge mess as well. But also there were people saying like, yeah, can I use this in my car as a car manufacturer? Or in my, in my whatever other data I do, you know, on my, on my yellow pages, whatever I have, you know, this kind of thing. Can I print it somewhere? Can I have this data? And we're like, yeah, sure, it's open, you know, it's open, so it's open data, it has an ODBM license, here's openstreetmap.org, go for it. And then like, what? <laughs> you know, where shall I, where shall, shall, let's make a contract. I'm like, no, we're not going to make a contract because I'm not selling you data, it's not my data. So we have actually one case where we discussed for three years, and after three years we got a, a contract which still had like these paragraphs in it that, that this data is from us. And we're like, what have I been talking about for the last three years? You know? The other thing is, um, the other thing is that, but actually we have cases where this is really cool, like uh, city councils who put it on the city page and stuff like that. So, and it's still we encourage people to use this data, of course. Um, but the other thing is what's complicated is this share alike part of the ODBL license. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but it means this data is free, you can use it commercially, whatever. Okay. The result of what you do needs to be the same license. So now we were talking, 
with large companies who got interested in our story, saying this would be so awesome to have in our to have in our app, which has 100 million users or something. But you know what? You're not the only data provider. We have 29 others, and actually we have worldwide contracts with 29 lawyer companies on what we can do and cannot do. And those 29 lawyers are going to sue you if we take your data for free. Because someday somebody might come and say, you know what, your huge data is also open source now, because ODBL share life. So they went away. You know? And I said, like, if we had owned the data in the beginning, I was just like, you know, CC0, whatever. But this is the case now, we accept this, of course. It took us a long time to say, you know, you cannot change a project with a million users, which grew for 15 years or 10 years, I don't know how old is open street from now. 10 years. 10 years, yeah. Uh, so of course we cannot change it. That's the kind of world. And I'm not sure if any of you knows about Waze, this um, Tel Aviv-based startup. They, they said, you know, fuck you, we create all the data for now with users we just invent through some kind of routing app. And they sold the thing for $1 billion, you know, just without having the share like thing, so that they can sell the data. And I still hate them for it, and I hate, you know, the whole situation for it, but that's why they grew faster than we did, probably. You know, we, the open street, my community. Well, I cannot change it. <laughs> uh, and as I said, the takeaway is if you do an open source project or something based on open data, um, uh, you have many challenges, but actually we have no regrets doing this. And it's better, way better than doing it alone. We could never have done any of this without OpenStreetMap and all the people who helped us. And we could not have done it with proprietary data. So the next time, if you, if you ask yourself, does this place have stairs in the entry, you know, just tag it. That's it.